The quiet town of Brookside had always seemed like an idyllic place to settle down. Quaint streets, friendly neighbors, and only the occasional disturbance, usually a neighborly spat or a runaway pet. Detective Sarah Martinez had worked in Brookside for over a decade, handling mostly mundane cases, the kind that didn't make the news. But then there was the house, as her department would later call it. For her, the memory of that case was as vivid as if she just walked through its doors. It was the one she could never shake. It all started with a phone call. An elderly couple, Robert and Edith Hastings, had lived in that house for nearly 50 years. They were beloved by neighbors and known for their lavish, welcoming Halloween displays each year. But one night, the Hastings went silent. Their mailbox filled with letters, their lights stayed off, and even stranger, no one saw them leave. The neighbors began to worry. Someone finally called the police to request a wellness check, fearing the worst, that the elderly couple had perhaps passed away quietly, together, in their home. Sarah and her partner, Officer Paul Groves, took the call. They were the first to arrive, the yard overgrown and eerily quiet. As Sarah knocked on the door, a chill spread down her spine. She told herself it was just the autumn breeze, a common enough feeling on cold nights. But when she pressed her ear to the door and heard a faint scratching sound from inside, her heart skipped a beat. The door was unlocked, a red flag that hardened her professional instincts. She nodded to Paul, and they entered together, calling out, Brookside Police. Mr. and Mrs. Hastings? Is anyone home? Only silence answered. The entryway smelled musty, like rotting wood and dust. The air felt thick and stale. As they moved deeper into the house, they noticed the place looked untouched. Dishes were stacked neatly in the drying rack, a newspaper lay open on the living room couch, and slippers sat by an armchair. It was as if the couple had just vanished mid-routine. Sarah made her way toward the back of the house, where the scratching sound grew louder. It seemed to come from the basement door, a dark, narrow stairwell that descended into pitch blackness. She tried the light switch, but nothing happened. Flashlights out, she whispered to Paul, her voice barely audible, tension thickening her words. They descended slowly, their lights barely cutting through the darkness. As they stepped onto the basement floor, an overpowering smell hit them, a sickeningly sweet odor mixed with rot. They covered their noses, scanning the area, Boxes were piled along the walls, and old furniture was draped with dusty sheets. Then, in the corner, Sarah saw something that stopped her in her tracks. A cluster of cages, large enough to hold a person. Rusted iron bars and heavy padlocks sealed them shut. They looked unused, but not abandoned. As her light caught on something glinting inside one of the cages, she stepped closer. A chilling sight awaited her. Inside the cage were remnants, shreds of clothing, brittle and old, but unmistakably human-sized. Long strands of hair clung to the bars, darkened and stiff. Panic welled up in her throat, but she forced herself to keep looking. The room had more cages, each one empty but haunting, as if they held an imprint of suffering. Sarah's pulse quickened, and she turned to Paul, who was scanning the walls with his flashlight. That's when they saw it. Written on the wall in dark, dried streaks was a message that sent ice through Sarah's veins. We will never leave. A noise behind them made them whirl around, flashlights shaking in their hands. A shadow flitted past, darting back into the darkness before they could catch a clear glimpse. It was small, low to the ground, and disturbingly fast. They both held their breath, their eyes wide and fixated on the blackness just beyond their lights. As they scanned the darkness, a soft, rhythmic sound began to emerge. It was a faint, whispered chant that seemed to echo from the walls themselves. It was nearly unintelligible, but as they strained to listen, one phrase became clear. You'll stay forever. Then, with a creak that sounded as if the house itself was groaning, the basement door at the top of the stairs slammed shut. They rushed up the stairs, trying the knob, but it wouldn't budge. They were trapped. They banged on the door, calling out, but all they heard in response was that scratching sound again, this time much closer, directly on the other side of the door. As their banging grew more frantic, the scratching turned to pounding, rhythmic and menacing, like someone or something was waiting just beyond, eager to get in. Sarah felt a prickling on the back of her neck, and when she turned around, she saw a figure at the bottom of the stairs, barely visible in the dim light. It was frail and hunched, with long, tangled hair obscuring its face. It looked up slowly, fixing them with empty, 
hollow eyes that were somehow filled with an unbearable, silent scream. Paul was muttering under his breath, This isn't real. This can't be real. But Sarah was frozen, locked in the creature's gaze. It raised a bony finger, pointing directly at her, and whispered, Welcome home. In a surge of terror, Sarah threw herself against the door, pounding and screaming, finally breaking it open. She and Paul burst out, nearly falling over each other in their desperation to escape. They didn't stop running until they reached their patrol car, slamming the doors and driving off with hearts pounding so loudly they could hardly hear each other. When they returned the next day with backup, the basement was empty. The cages were gone, the walls clean, and the house seemed to have aged years overnight. There was no sign of the Hastings, no traces of any struggle. Their things were still there, but any sign of the couple had vanished, as if they'd never existed. But Sarah couldn't forget those hollow eyes, nor the message scratched faintly into the basement door, words that had somehow appeared overnight. The last time she set foot in that house, she read it one more time. You'll stay forever. To this day, Detective Sarah Martinez can't drive past that house without feeling an intense urge to turn away, as though something from within still watches her, waiting. Every so often, she hears rumors of a new family moving in, but they never stay long. Some claim the house is haunted, others say it's cursed, but Sarah knows better. She knows that something in that house wants people there, and once they enter, it never truly lets them go. The story of The Face in the Woods had been passed down through the ranks of officers in the small, isolated town of Ashford for as long as anyone could remember. Young officers laughed it off as urban legend, a creepy tale told to spook rookies fresh on the force. But the older officers, the ones who'd worked the late night shifts, the ones who'd seen the shadows moving in the mist, knew there was truth behind the story. Sergeant Ian Parker had been on the force long enough to know better than to dismiss it, though he never spoke of it himself. Until the night he and his partner, Officer Sarah Lawson, took the call. It was a frigid November evening, the kind that fills the air with an unnatural quiet. A call came in from a panicked hiker who'd seen lights flickering in the forest near the edge of town, a desolate stretch called Ironwood Grove. The hiker mentioned seeing a figure moving through the trees and had heard what he described as a voice that wasn't right. The man had refused to stay, leaving even before he finished the call. When Ian and Sarah arrived, they found the entrance to Ironwood Grove shrouded in fog, a dense mist swirling in the beams of their flashlights. The forest was dead silent, no chirping crickets or rustling leaves. It was as though the trees themselves were holding their breath. Sarah tried to break the tension with a light-hearted laugh. I swear, if this is some high school kid playing a prank. But Ian cut her off, his tone grim. If you see anything, anything, don't try to talk to it. Just follow me out. They moved carefully through the underbrush, their breaths clouding in front of them. The farther they went, the thicker the mist became, swallowing their flashlight beams. The silence felt oppressive, as if the trees were pressing in on them, waiting. After walking for what felt like hours, they saw something ahead. A dim light flickering through the trees. It was just a few hundred feet away, hovering at eye level, swaying in a hypnotic rhythm. As they drew closer, Sarah squinted, trying to make sense of what they were seeing. It was a lantern, old-fashioned and rusted, hanging from a low branch. The light inside flickered erratically, as if a dying flame struggled to stay alive. Then they saw it. Just beyond the lantern, standing still and silent, was a figure. Tall, impossibly thin, it stood facing away from them, with a neck stretched far too long to be human. Its clothes looked old, tattered rags hanging off its angular frame, but that wasn't, wasn't what made the dead in their tracks. No, it was the hair, long and tangled, falling around its head in stringy clumps that looked like they hadn't been brushed in decades. And then, as they watched, it turned. Its face was something out of a nightmare. The skin was gray and stretched tight over sharp bones, eyes sunken and empty, as if they'd been gouged out long ago. Its mouth was wide, unnaturally so, curving up into a twisted grin that split the face from ear to ear, revealing a set of jagged teeth that looked like they belonged to an animal. Sarah's hand flew to her mouth to stifle a scream, and Ian felt his stomach lurch. The figure took a slow step forward, just that had a moving with an eerie, unnatural grace. It seemed to drift rather than walk, as if its feet barely touched the ground. 
They both took a step back, but Sarah's foot slipped on a moss-covered root, and she stumbled, crashing to the ground. In that moment of noise, the figure's head snapped toward them, its empty eye sockets narrowing as if it could still see. It began to move faster. Ian grabbed Sarah, yanking her to her feet, and they turned and ran. Branches whipped at their faces as they stumbled through the underbrush, adrenaline pushing them to move faster than they thought possible. Behind them, the sound of snapping twigs and crunching leaves grew louder, closer, as if the figure was gliding just inches behind them. As they broke through the tree line, the fog seemed to lift, and the forest fell silent again. They didn't stop until they reached the patrol car, both of them gasping for breath. They slammed the doors shut, locking them instinctively. For a moment, they sat in stunned silence, the reality of what they'd seen settling in. Ian looked over at Sarah, her face pale and her eyes wide with terror. Did you, did you see its face? She whispered, her voice barely audible. Ian nodded, his hands gripping the steering wheel so tightly his knuckles turned white. That, that was the face, he murmured. It was the legend they'd all heard about, just the one that was never supposed to be real. The face in the woods. The figure that had reportedly haunted Ironwood Grove for decades, seen only by those who were unlucky enough to cross its path. The next morning, Ian and Sarah went back to the forest with a team, hoping to find some trace of what they'd seen. But the lantern was gone. The underbrush where they'd seen the figure was untouched, as if no one had been there at all. There were no footprints, no broken branches, nothing to prove that what they'd seen was real. But as they turned to leave, Ian spotted something on the ground near the tree line. It was an old, rusted locket lying in the dirt. He picked it up, and a chill ran down his spine. Inside was a black and white photograph of a woman, her face twisted into the same terrible grin they'd seen in the woods. They tried to look up the woman's identity, but there was no record of anyone resembling her in the town's archives. Ian couldn't shake the feeling that whoever she was... She'd been waiting in those woods a long time, waiting for someone to come close enough for her to show herself. And now, she had. After that night, neither Ian nor Sarah ever went near Ironwood Grove again. But sometimes, on cold, foggy nights, when Ian drove past the edge of the forest, he'd see a flicker of light in the distance, a faint glow that hovered just out of reach. And on rare occasions, he'd catch a glimpse of that face staring back at him from the trees, grinning with that hollow, endless hunger. It was then that he knew the truth about Ironwood Grove. Whatever was out there, whatever had waited in those woods for all those years, it was still waiting, and it would wait forever, drawing people in with its lantern and its twisted smile, welcoming them to its silent, eternal vigil in the darkness. It was the middle of the night when Officer David Hunt received the call. He was new to the town of Cedar Ridge, a quiet, almost sleepy community in the middle of nowhere. David had transferred from a big city precinct, expecting a slower pace. But what he didn't expect was a call from the Edgewood Orphanage. Edgewood was more a shadow than a building. It sat on a hill on the outskirts of town, a forgotten relic that the locals whispered about but rarely mentioned by name. It had been closed for decades, a crumbling monument to the past with a history of abuse allegations, disappearances, and untold horrors. People said that something evil lingered there, something dark that had never left. The call came from a young woman named Hannah, who'd recently moved to Cedar Ridge. She dared herself to explore the orphanage at night, hoping to capture some supernatural footage for her popular online channel. Her friends said she was fearless that she'd go anywhere and do anything for a thrill. But now her voice trembled as she spoke to dispatch, barely a whisper, there's... There's someone in here, someone watching me. By the time David arrived, the orphanage loomed against the night sky like a dark specter, windows shattered and ivy curling over the stone walls. He called out for Hannah, but only his own voice echoed back. The heavy doors creaked open with a groan, and he stepped inside, his flashlight cutting through the thick layers of dust and decay. Inside, the air was thick and stale, carrying a foul scent of mold and something metallic, like rust or blood. The floorboards groaned beneath his boots as he moved down the main hallway, each step echoing down the abandoned corridors. Graffiti covered the walls. Messages scrawled in dark ink that seemed to fade in and out of his, of his flashlight's beam. 
Most of it was the usual rebellious nonsense, uh, but here and there, David spotted odd phrases that gave him pause. Don't look at them. Run if you hear them laugh. And worse, they want to play. He heard a faint noise down one of the side halls, a soft, scuffling sound, and then unmistakably the sound of a girl's voice, thin and afraid, calling, Please, help me. It was Hannah. David followed the voice deeper into the orphanage, his skin prickling as he passed what once had been the common room, then the sleeping quarters with rows of decaying, broken-down cots. The deeper he went, the colder it seemed to get, the temperature dropping until his breath misted in the air. Finally, he reached the door to the basement, slightly ajar. As he peered down the staircase, his flashlight illuminating the descending steps, he heard the voice again, closer now, desperate. Please, I'm down here. He steeled himself and began his descent. The basement was even colder, a damp, stone-walled room filled with old furniture draped in filthy sheets and broken toys scattered across the floor. At the far end, his flashlight caught a flicker of movement. A figure crouched in the corner, her hair a tangled mess, her arms wrapped around her knees. Hannah, he called, his voice steady but soft. She turned slowly, and for a moment he felt a wave of relief. It was her, the young woman who had called for help. But as he moved closer, his relief faded, replaced by a creeping dread that settled in his bones. Her eyes were wide, staring at him with a look of hollow fear, her mouth open as though she were still screaming, though no sound came out. She lifted her hand to point at something behind him. David whipped around, his flashlight shaking, and there, emerging from the shadows, were three children, each standing unnaturally still, their skin gray, their eyes blank and unseeing. They looked no older than ten, dressed in the ragged remnants of clothing that seemed decades old, with pale, bony arms hanging limply at their sides. David's instinct told him to run, but his legs wouldn't move. The children's faces were twisted into unnatural smiles, and then, without a sound, they began to move closer. Their bare feet made no noise against the cold, stone floor, but their breaths, ragged and shallow, grew louder, echoing off the walls in the silent basement. He backed up slowly, his eyes darting between Hannah and the children. Hannah, we need to go. Now, he whispered. But she didn't move. She only continued to stare, her gaze unfocused, as if she were seeing something beyond the room, something far worse than the children in front of them. The children's mouths opened in unison, and a low, whispering chant filled the air, like the sound of leaves rustling on a windless night. Will you play with us? Forever and ever. Their voices blended, soft but chilling, echoing endlessly in the confined space. David fought to find his voice, his mind racing. No, he said firmly, trying to pull Hannah to her feet. But her body was cold, rigid, her eyes fixed on the children with that haunting, vacant stare. And then one of the children, the smallest, a boy with hollow cheeks and dark circles under his eyes, stepped forward, extending a hand. David felt an overwhelming, irrational compulsion to take it, as if his body was no longer his own. He felt his hand start to rise, reaching toward the child's icy fingers. But just as he was about to make contact, a harsh whisper sounded in his ear, a voice that seemed to come from nowhere and everywhere all at once. Don't touch them. The spell broke. David pulled his hand back, forcing himself to turn away, his heart pounding in his chest. He hoisted Hannah over his shoulder and ran up the stairs, um, the children's voices growing louder, their chant rising to an ear-splitting wail as he climbed. He didn't look back, didn't dare slow down until he burst out of the orphanage doors and into the cold night air. The chanting stopped as suddenly as it had begun. The orphanage fell silent, the oppressive darkness lifting as he staggered back to the patrol car, his breath coming in gasps. Hannah lay limp in his arms, still staring blankly into space, her body shivering uncontrollably. He called for backup, and when they arrived, he told them everything, every detail, the chanting, the ghostly children, the voice that had saved him from their grasp. But no one else went inside that night. The officers who came later only took David's report and left quickly, a grim understanding in their eyes. Everyone in town knew the stories. They knew what lingered in that cursed building. Hannah was never the same. She spoke only in whispers after that night, rambling about the children who wanted to play, their twisted faces seared into her mind. She moved out of town within a month, her spirit hollowed out like a shell. David stayed, though he refused to ever go near the orphanage again.
Over the years, he learned of others who had ventured into Edgewood, thrill-seekers who came for a night of horror, hoping to catch a glimpse of the ghost children. Some made it out, their faces pale, their voices empty. But others weren't so lucky. They vanished, one by one, their names whispered as warnings to anyone foolish enough to venture there. And every so often, on dark, misty nights, if you stood near Edgewood Orphanage, you might hear a faint whisper on the wind, children's voices carried through the air, calling, Will you play with us forever and ever? Officer Rachel Monroe had seen her fair share of strange cases, but nothing prepared her for the one that would come to haunt her dreams forever. The small town of Willow Creek had always had an eerie side, surrounded by thick woods with twisting trees and dense, perpetual mist that clung to the ground like a shroud. But in recent months, there had been reports of strange disappearances. Locals called it the caller in the woods. It started simply enough. People out on late night walks or drives would hear a voice calling their name from the trees, a soft whisper that carried on the wind. At first, they would shrug it off as imagination, but the voice would grow insistent, louder, closer, like the person was just out of sight, hidden in the darkness. Then, as the stories went, they'd vanish without a trace. Rachel had dismissed it all as local superstition until the night she was called to investigate a missing teenager. The boy, Ethan, had gone out to meet friends but never arrived. His parents swore they'd heard him call for help from the woods, but when they searched, there was nothing. They had called Rachel in desperation. Rachel started her search just past midnight, walking along the edge of the woods, calling Ethan's name. The forest was silent, an unnatural hush falling over it as she ventured deeper. Her flashlight sliced through the dark, illuminating only twisted branches and damp earth. After what felt like hours, she began to hear something faint, so quiet it could have been a trick of her mind. Rachel. She froze. It was impossible. No one knew she was out here. She hadn't told a soul, not even her dispatcher. Her heart hammered in her chest, but she told herself it was just the wind. She kept moving, but the voice came again, this time louder clearer. Rachel? It was a boy's voice, soft and familiar, a perfect imitation of Ethan. Her heart raced, a mixture of dread and the faint hope that maybe he was alive, that he was waiting for her to find him. She moved toward the sound, her boots crunching on the wet leaves, her flashlight shaking in her hand. Then, just ahead, she saw it, a figure standing perfectly still in a clearing, pale and thin, its head tilted slightly as though listening. Ethan? She whispered. The figure didn't answer, didn't move. She took a step forward, shining her flashlight on the figure, but the beam flickered. She hit the flashlight, and when the light steadied, she felt her stomach drop. It was Ethan, or rather, something that looked like him. His face was pale, his eyes wide and glassy, lips parted slightly, but his expression was blank, his gaze unfocused. Ethan, she called out, her voice breaking. He turned his head slowly, too slowly, until his empty eyes met hers. His mouth opened wider, and from it came that same whispering voice, hollow and lifeless. Rachel? She took a step back, her instincts screaming that something was wrong, terribly wrong. And then she noticed something else. His feet weren't touching the ground. His shoes hung inches above the forest floor, his body swaying slightly as if held up by some invisible force. The flashlight flickered again, and when it steadied, Ethan was gone. The clearing was empty, as if he'd never been there at all. A chill ran down her spine, and she took a shaky breath, trying to steady herself. She couldn't explain what she'd seen, but she knew she had to get out of the forest. She turned and started walking quickly back toward her car, fighting the urge to run. But after a few minutes, the whispering returned, closer now, echoing all around her. Rachel, don't leave. It was Ethan's voice, but layered mixed with other voices, men, women, children, all whispering her name in unison, like a chorus from beyond. The voices grew louder, and as they did, shadows began to shift around her, shapes taking form in the dark, figures emerging from the trees. They were people, dozens of them, maybe more, all standing just within the shadows. Their eyes were dark, sunken, hollow, and their mouths moved in a whispering chant, calling her name over and over. She could make out some of their faces, faces of people she knew had gone missing over the years. There was Mrs. Abernathy, the kind old woman who'd vanished one spring. Jackson, the high schooler who'd disappeared after prom night. 
and the local postman, who hadn't been seen in a decade. Their expressions were blank, eyes empty, as though whatever had once made them human had long since faded away. Rachel's heart thundered as she backed away, fighting the primal fear clawing at her mind. She wanted to scream, but her voice felt trapped in her throat. Then one of the figures stepped forward, reaching out a hand. It was Ethan. His arm outstretched, Galileo with his fingers gray and bony. Rachel, he whispered, his voice cracked and hollow. Stay with us. It's so cold. She stumbled back, her flashlight falling to the ground, its beam rolling to the side and casting twisted shadows across the trees. She could hear the voices closing in around her, the whispering growing louder, until it was all she could hear, like a thousand voices calling to her from the darkness, inviting her into the woods. Then, in a final burst of panic, she found her voice and screamed, turning and running as fast as she could. She sprinted through the underbrush, branches tearing at her clothes and scratching her face, the voices fading behind her, but still calling, calling, even as she neared the edge of the woods. Finally, she broke through the trees and staggered into the clearing where her car was parked. She dove inside, locking the doors, her chest heaving as she tried to catch her breath. She sat there in silence, um, staring at the forest, half expecting to see the figures emerge from the trees. But there was nothing, only the silent, dark woods and the faint rustling of leaves. Shaking, she started the engine and sped away, not daring to look back. The next morning, they found her flashlight in the clearing, but there was no other sign of anyone ever being there. No footprints, no disturbed foliage, nothing. She filed a report, but it was quietly dismissed as a case of overwork and stress. Some of her colleagues even laughed, thinking it was a joke, something to tease her about. But Rachel knew what she'd seen and she would never forget those hollow faces and those empty eyes. She never went back to the woods after that night, never again took a case that led her close to the forest's edge. But sometimes on quiet nights, uh, when she was alone in her home, she would hear a faint whisper on the wind, drifting in through her open window, calling her name, inviting her back into the woods, and she knew that if she ever went back, she'd never come out again. The story of Officer Mark Delaney's last night on the force is something whispered in hushed tones around his old precinct. He had been a seasoned cop, respected by all, a practical man who scoffed at anything remotely paranormal. But his final call changed everything. It was around 2 a.m. on a cold, rainy night in December uh, when a call came in from Hollowbrook Manor, an abandoned mansion that sat on the outskirts of town, shrouded in rumors and legend. Hollowbrook had been empty for nearly 70 years, and no one went near it. Its windows were shattered, its doors barely hanging on their hinges, and the townspeople told stories about the place, of disappearances, strange lights, sounds in the night. But, as Mark always said, there's an explanation for everything. The call reported strange sounds coming from the mansion. Music, laughter, clinking glasses, as though a grand party were in full swing. Mark figured it was some teenagers causing trouble, using the house as a place to drink and fool around. He drove out alone, not bothering to call for backup. It would be an easy job, or so he thought. The rain fell in steady sheets, the wind howling as he parked his cruiser outside the decaying manor. The air was thick with the scent of damp earth and rot. Mark clicked on his flashlight and made his way up the crumbling steps, pushing open the grand double doors. Inside... The air was stale and cold, and an unnatural silence filled the hall. His flashlight beam cut through thick layers of dust, revealing ornate, decayed wallpaper, faded portraits, and broken furniture. Yet, as he stepped into the main hall, he was struck by the faint sound of piano music drifting from somewhere deeper in the house. He told himself it was just the wind, the rain, maybe even his imagination, but as he moved further inside, the music grew louder. It was a soft, haunting melody, played with a delicacy that seemed out of place in the abandoned house, and underneath it he began to hear murmurs, voices whispering, indistinct but filled with laughter and low conversation, like the hum of a distant party. A chill ran down his spine, and he gripped his flashlight tighter. He moved down a long hallway toward what appeared to be a ballroom, his boots echoing in the empty space. The ballroom was grand with high ceilings and tall windows that let in only slivers of moonlight. 
But as his light swept across the room, he froze. There, in the center of the ballroom, was a gathering of people. Men and women in elegant, old-fashioned clothing, laughing, chatting, swirling around as though in the middle of a grand dance. They looked almost real, almost solid. Yet there was something wrong with them. Their faces were pale, their eyes blank, as though they were staring through the world rather than at it. Mark's heart raced, but he forced himself to keep walking, trying to convince himself it was some trick, maybe reflections off the broken glass or leftover decorations someone had put there to scare trespassers. But as he stepped closer, the music stopped abruptly, and the people turned, their blank, empty eyes fixing on him. His breath caught. He felt trapped in their gaze, unable to look away. Then, as if some silent signal had passed between them, they began to move toward him, their footsteps soundless, their movements smooth, graceful, like ghosts floating on air. Who are you? He called, his voice breaking the silence. But they didn't answer. The closest figure, a tall woman with an elaborate gown and a blank porcelain-like face, stopped just inches from him, reaching out a hand. Her fingers were ice cold, passing through his arm as though he were made of mist. His skin burned where she touched him, a sensation that shot up his arm and left him frozen in place. We've been waiting for you, she said softly, her voice a distant echo. Come join the dance. Stay forever. Mark stumbled back, breaking free of her grip. He backed away toward the door, but the guests only continued advancing, filling the space, blocking his path. He turned and ran down the hall, his heart pounding as he heard footsteps echoing behind him, faster and faster. The whispers grew louder, their voices calling him, urging him to return, to join them. As he reached the front door, he threw it open, stumbling into the cold rain outside. He didn't look back as he sprinted to his cruiser, jumping in and slamming the door. His hands shook as he turned the key, the engine roaring to life. In his rearview mirror, he caught a glimpse of the ballroom windows. The figures were all there, lined up at the glass, their blank faces staring at him, watching as he sped away. Back at the station, his colleagues found him pale, soaked, and shaking. Um, when they asked him what had happened, he only muttered, Hollowbrook, they're in there, waiting. He couldn't explain it, couldn't make sense of what he'd seen. Some of the other officers laughed it off, calling it stress, fatigue, or a prank gone wrong. But Mark knew. He'd seen something that night, something that could never be explained. After that, he refused to talk about Hollowbrook Manor. A month later, he put in his resignation and moved to another town. But those who knew him best said that he was never the same. He'd grown quiet, his eyes always darting to shadows, his ears tuned to every sound, as if expecting to hear that haunting music again. A year after Mark left town, a new officer named Alex took a call about Hollowbrook Manor. He, too, dismissed the stories as nonsense. But when he went to check it out, he was never seen again. His patrol car was found the next morning, parked outside the manor, the engine still warm, the driver's door left open, and his flashlight lying in the mud. Inside the mansion, they found no sign of him. Only his voice recorder lay in the ballroom, covered in dust. When the investigators pressed play, there was nothing but silence, broken only by faint, static-laden whispers and the soft, eerie strains of a piano playing a slow, haunting waltz. Uh, to this day, Hollowbrook Manor stands empty, but locals say that if you listen closely on quiet nights, you can hear the music drifting on the wind, accompanied by soft laughter, as though the party never truly ended, as though the guests are still waiting, calling for anyone who dares to join them in their eternal silent dance. Officer Lily Carter never expected to see the town's oldest urban legend come to life on her shift. She'd heard the stories since she was a child, back when her grandparents would tell her about the Weeper of Pine Hollow Road. Most people in town had heard of it, a woman dressed in tattered white, roaming the old forest road, sobbing softly. Some said she was looking for her lost child. Others claimed she was a warning spirit, but everyone agreed on one thing. If you heard her crying close behind you, do not look back. Um, the legend went that anyone who dared to look would never make it out of Pine Hollow. It was an unusually dark night, the kind of blackness that feels almost suffocating, when Officer Carter got the call. A young couple had gone missing out on Pine Hollow Road. They'd been driving home and never arrived. Dispatch mentioned that a friend of theirs had received a final text message from the couple 
just a single word, weeping. Lily felt an uncomfortable prickling at the base of her neck, but shook it off. She wasn't superstitious, and the stories had always seemed like small-town myths to scare kids. Still, she couldn't deny the eerie feeling that Pine Hollow Road held, especially on nights like this. When she arrived, Lily saw the couple's car just off the road, parked haphazardly, its headlights still dimly illuminating the forest. There were no signs of them nearby, but as she scanned the area with her flashlight, she caught a glimpse of something strange. Two sets of footprints leading into the woods, the dirt and dead leaves disturbed as if they'd run off in a hurry. Taking a deep breath, she called out their names, but only silence answered her. She followed the tracks, her flashlight slicing through the darkness as she ventured deeper into the woods. The night was eerily quiet, as though the forest itself was holding its breath. And then, just as she thought she'd imagined it, she heard it. A faint, heart-wrenching sob echoing through the trees. The sound chilled her, low and mournful, filled with a grief that seemed almost tangible. She froze, her pulse quickening, her mind flashing back to the stories, the warnings to never turn around. The sobbing grew louder, closer. It felt as if it was coming from all around her, reverberating in her ears and making her skin crawl. She gripped her flashlight tighter, forcing herself to stay calm, to ignore the urge to turn and look. But the weeping grew even louder, almost desperate, like the woman was right behind her, reaching out, pleading to be seen. She swallowed, her instincts screaming at her to get out, to run back to her car and forget she'd ever come. But she had to find the couple. They were still out there somewhere. Gritting her teeth, she continued forward, following the tracks deeper into the woods, all while the sobbing continued relentlessly, as if it was attached to her, shadowing her every step. After what felt like hours, she stumbled into a small clearing. There, under the pale light of her flashlight, she saw the couple. They were standing perfectly still, their backs to her, their bodies tense, as if frozen in place. She called their names, but they didn't respond. Her heart sank. Something was horribly wrong. She moved closer, reaching out a hand to touch the woman's shoulder, but before she could, both of them turned to face her. Their eyes were wide with terror, their faces pale as though they'd seen something far beyond human comprehension. What happened? She whispered, dread prickling her skin. The man opened his mouth to speak, but his voice came out barely audible, a hoarse, broken whisper. She's, she's behind us. She was crying. We heard her crying, but we looked, we looked. They began to sob, their voices joining in with the weeping that still hung in the air, only inches away from her ears. The sound was unbearable now, so close it was as if the woman was standing directly behind her, breathing down her neck. Every instinct screamed at her to look, but something deep in her gut held her back. The woman's voice, soft and hollow, spoke directly into her ear. Please, look at me. Lily's blood ran cold. She could feel the presence of the weeper, almost taste her sorrow, the overwhelming grief that wrapped around her like a freezing fog. The couple stared at her, their tear-streaked faces filled with silent pleas, as if warning her of something too terrible to name. But the crying continued, relentless and insistent, filling her mind, drowning out all reason. She could feel the woman behind her, could almost feel the cold touch of fingers reaching for her shoulder. Please, the voice whispered again, breaking into a soft sob. Lily's resolve weakened, her mind screamed for her to ignore it, but her body seemed to move of its own accord. Slowly, almost against her will, she began to turn, her flashlight dropping to her side. But just as her head turned, she saw a glint of something at the edge of her vision. A figure in white, her face obscured, her head bent low. And then she heard it, the faintest, softest whisper. Don't! The voice wasn't the weepers, it was something else. Something that gave her the strength to snap her gaze away her heart racing as she resisted the urge to look fully. She took a deep, steadying breath, closing her eyes, fighting the impulse to turn and face the weeping figure. Then, with all the strength she could muster, she grasped the couple by their arms, he pulling them away from the clearing, back toward the direction of her car. The crying faded slowly, reluctantly, but she didn't dare look back, even as the sounds turned to shrieks of rage, filling the woods with a scream that echoed for what felt like miles. When they reached the edge of the forest, Lily collapsed by the side of the road, her breath coming in gasps, her entire body trembling. She looked up at the couple, who were both staring at her, their expressions filled with something between awe and gratitude.
You, you didn't look, the man whispered, his voice shaky. Lily shook her head, feeling the weight of what could have happened pressing on her mind. She didn't know how she'd resisted, but she was certain that if she'd turned, she would have joined the others who had disappeared into Pine Hollow, her name just another one in the town's whispered legends. The couple was silent on the ride back, he, each of them pale and haunted, as if a part of them was still back in the woods, forever bound to that lonely weeping spirit. When she dropped them off, they thanked her quietly, their voices filled with a hollow sadness that made her skin crawl. Lily took a week off after that night, but she never really stopped feeling the cold, lingering touch of that night. The weeping haunted her dreams, and on stormy nights she swore she could hear it echoing through the town, faint and forlorn like a cry carried by the wind. No one ever found out who or what the weeper was, but from then on, Lily warned anyone who dared to wander down Pine Hollow Road, if you hear her crying, run, and whatever you do, don't look back. Officer Tom Weaver was known in his precinct for his nerves of steel. Nothing fazed him. Gruesome crime scenes, eerie night patrols, the things that made rookie cops double-check their locks at night. But all that changed with the case that still haunts him to this day. The man in the mirror. It started with a call to an old townhouse on Maple Street, a decrepit place that had seen better days. The tenant, Mr. Henry Dawson, had phoned in a frantic report about someone or something in his house. His voice was wild with fear, and the dispatcher could barely make sense of him. All Tom could gather was that Dawson claimed to see a man standing in his mirror, staring back at him, night after night. When Tom arrived, Mr. Dawson was visibly shaken, an elderly man with a haunted look in his eyes. His hands shook as he led Tom to the bathroom at the end of a narrow, dim hallway. The air was cold, colder than seemed possible for a house with central heating. Tom could feel it sink into his bones as he stood before the bathroom door. Please, Dawson whispered, his voice barely more than a breath. He's in there. Every night. He's just there. Waiting. Tom nodded, fighting the urge to roll his eyes. But as he opened the door, an inexplicable chill ran through him. The bathroom was ordinary, small, with a medicine cabinet above the sink and a dusty old mirror. But it was colder in there, like a freezer. His breath misted in the air. Tom stepped in, flicking on the light, and immediately turned to the mirror. Nothing unusual. He looked back at Dawson, who had stopped in the doorway, his eyes wide and filled with dread. It's just a mirror, Mr. Dawson. There's nothing here. Dawson shook his head, his voice barely more than a whisper. He only shows himself to me. At night. Always at night. Tom sighed and took another look around. But as he leaned in closer to the mirror, he noticed something strange. His reflection wasn't quite right. There was a subtle lag in its movement, an almost imperceptible delay, as if his reflection were waiting, watching, mimicking his every move just a fraction too late. He shook it off, dismissing it as a trick of the poor lighting, and gave Dawson his reassurances before heading back to the station. But that night, as he brushed his teeth at home, he noticed something unsettling in his own bathroom mirror, a slight movement, something in his peripheral vision, almost like his reflection was slower. He stood still, watching himself, nothing unusual. But that faint sense of wrongness lingered. Over the next few days, the sensation grew worse. He'd catch glimpses of his reflection out of the corner of his eye, slightly delayed, slightly different, almost as if it were observing him rather than reflecting him. It made him jump, his heart pounding with an unease he couldn't shake. Then the nightmares began. Every night, Tom dreamed he was trapped, standing before an endless wall of mirrors, his own reflection staring back at him, blank-faced, unblinking. But in the dream, his reflection wasn't, wasn't following his movements. It was moving on its own, watching him with an intensity that felt malevolent, almost hungry. One night, the dream took a darker turn. His reflection reached out toward him, placing a hand against the mirror, palm flat against the glass. He could feel a coldness radiating from it, a chill that seeped into his bones. And then the reflection smiled, a twisted, crooked smile that he knew wasn't his own. He woke up in a sweat, his heart pounding, every muscle in his body tense. But when he looked around, he was still in his room. He forced himself to calm down, chalking it up to stress. But as he turned his head toward his bathroom door, he felt a sudden, inexplicable dread. His own bathroom mirror seemed darker than usual, a thin mist clinging to its surface, 
It was then he remembered Mr. Dawson's terrified face, his trembling voice. Tom's skin prickled with fear, but he felt compelled to check to see if he was imagining things. When he flicked on the bathroom light, the mirror stared back at him. For a moment, everything seemed normal, but then his reflection moved, too slowly, lagging behind by just a fraction of a second. And then, as he watched in horrified silence, his reflection's eyes began to change. They grew darker, hollow like two voids, swallowing the light, black and endless. Tom stumbled back, barely able to tear his gaze away. His reflection's mouth curved into that same eerie smile he'd seen in his dream, an unnatural grin that stretched too wide, too far. His reflection raised its hand, placing it against the glass, a chilling mimicry of his own hand. Tom took a shaky breath, trying to ground himself. He whispered, You're not real. But his reflection's voice echoed back, distorted, low, almost mocking. Are you so sure? He blinked, and suddenly his reflection's hand was on the other side of the mirror, reaching through inches from his face. He gasped, stumbling back as he watched the hand slip out of the mirror, the cold radiating from it, freezing the air around him. His reflection climbed out step by step until it stood before him, an identical version of himself, but twisted, wrong. The other him cocked its head, eyes still black, that horrible grin never fading. I'm the one who watches, it said, its voice thick with a twisted, mocking tone. It's my turn. Before Tom could react, it reached out, its fingers closing around his throat. He tried to scream, but no sound came out, only a choked gasp as the world spun and darkened. He could feel himself fading, slipping this as though his very essence were being pulled away, replaced. When he opened his eyes, he was standing in the bathroom again, but everything felt wrong. His reflection, no, the other him, was standing outside the mirror, staring back with his own eyes. He tried to move, to speak, but he couldn't. He was trapped, locked behind the glass, looking out at a world that no longer belonged to him. The other Tom, his own dark reflection, grinned, lifting a hand in a mocking wave before turning and walking away, leaving him trapped in silence, bound to the mirror, forever watching a world he could no longer touch. He screamed, but no one heard. His voice was swallowed by the glass, his cries echoing back at him, empty and hollow. Now, if anyone asked where Tom Weaver went, they would never know the truth. But sometimes, officers who visit his old bathroom catch a glimpse of something in the mirror. A flash of movement, a shadow, a face twisted in silent agony, hands pressed against the glass, eyes pleading for help. And those who stare too long often swear that their own reflections seem to move just a little too slowly, as if something else, something wrong, is watching them from the other side. It's a story the precinct tells to rookies as a warning. Be careful when you look in the mirror. Sometimes, what stares back might not be you. The last case Officer Jake Phillips ever worked still terrifies his former colleagues. It's the story of the Whispering Woods, a place no one dares to enter at night. For years, people had disappeared there. Hikers, campers, and once even a local teenager. No bodies were ever found, only the occasional shoe, a forgotten flashlight, or a torn scrap of clothing left behind in the eerie silence of those dark woods. But when two children vanished from the edge of the woods one summer night, leaving nothing but a teddy bear by the road, the police were determined to find answers. That's when Jake got involved. Jake was a seasoned officer who believed in logic and reason. He scoffed at the rumors and warned the rookie officers not to let superstition cloud their thinking. People disappeared in the woods, he said, because it was vast, dark, and confusing. But after a full week with no leads and strange sounds reported by the search teams, Jake volunteered to do an overnight search himself. He didn't believe in ghost stories, but he did believe in putting fears to rest. Armed with a flashlight, radio, and his sidearm, Jake entered the woods just before dusk. The air was cool, thick with the scent of pine and damp earth, and as he moved deeper, an odd stillness settled around him. Not even the crickets were chirping. His flashlight cut through the gathering darkness, illuminating twisted branches and the occasional glint of dew on leaves. But after a while, the silence became oppressive. He tried his radio, but the static was thick, and each message he sent crackled without response. And then, just as he was about to turn back, he heard it, a whisper, soft as a breath echoing through the trees. Jake. The voice was faint, almost familiar, like an echo in his own mind. He stopped, 
heart pounding, sweeping his flashlight across the dense woods, but saw nothing. He tried to tell himself it was just the wind, maybe a distant animal, but then he heard it again, closer this time, more insistent. Jake, come here. It sounded like a child's voice, soft and pleading, and it sent a chill down his spine. The children. Maybe they'd gotten lost, maybe they were hurt or hiding. Ignoring the fear creeping up his spine, Jake followed the sound, his flashlight bouncing across the trees as he called out. But the deeper he went, the stranger the woods became. The trees seemed to close in, their branches reaching toward him, twisted and gnarled, almost as if they were alive. Shadows grew thicker, darker, and the air felt colder, pressing down on him like a weight, and the whispering grew louder, multiplying more voices calling his name. Jake, Jake, come closer. He shone his flashlight around, desperate to see anything, a clue, a glimpse of movement. But each time he thought he saw a shadow flit by, it vanished before he could focus. His heart pounded, his instincts screaming at him to turn back, but he pushed on, driven by the voices that sounded so close, so helpless. And then he saw it, a small figure standing just beyond the beam of his flashlight. It was one of the missing children, a little girl, her dress torn and dirty, her eyes wide and glassy. She stared at him without blinking, her face pale in the moonlight. Are you okay? He called, his voice shaky as he stepped toward her. But she didn't answer. She simply lifted her hand, pointing deeper into the woods, her eyes fixed on him in silent plea. Jake followed her gesture, feeling a pull, something almost magnetic urging him forward. The girl turned and walked ahead, her steps slow, silent, leading him through a dense tangle of trees. He tried to ask her questions, but she never responded, only kept walking, her figure barely visible in the dark. Finally, they reached a small clearing, and that's when he saw them, all the missing people. They stood in a silent circle, children and adults alike, their faces blank, eyes hollow, staring into the darkness. They looked like they'd been there for years, their clothes tattered, skin pale, as though they were frozen in place. In the center of the clearing was a massive tree, its trunk thick and twisted, its branches looming overhead like the skeletal arms of some ancient creature. Its roots snaked through the ground, tangled around stones and bones that glinted in the dim light. Jake's hand went to his radio, but when he pressed the button, nothing happened. The static was gone, replaced by silence. Then, slowly, the figures in the clearing turned their heads, each one staring at him with unblinking, empty eyes. A voice echoed through his mind, soft but powerful, like the rustling of leaves and the groaning of old wood. Stay with us, it whispered. Jake took a step back, but his legs felt heavy, rooted to the ground. He tried to move, to run, but something held him there, something he couldn't see. The air around him felt thick, suffocating, pressing down on him from all sides. The little girl stepped forward, her eyes still glassy, her mouth opening as if to speak. But instead, a low, haunting moan escaped her lips, a sound that echoed through the trees, bouncing off the trunks and surrounding him in an endless loop. The others joined in, their voices rising in a chilling harmony, an eerie, droning chant that filled the air, vibrating through his bones. Jake's mind raced as he fought against the invisible force holding him in place, but the more he struggled, the tighter it held him, the roots of the ancient tree seeming to creep closer, inching toward him like skeletal fingers. And then he saw it, a figure emerging from the tree itself, a shadow darker than the night, with hollow eyes that bore into him. It was tall impossibly tall, its form twisted and shifting like smoke and shadow given life. The figure stretched out a hand, its fingers long and thin, reaching toward him. Jake tried to scream, but no sound escaped his lips. The chanting grew louder, the voice of the lost calling, urging him to join them. St the shadow whispered, its voice filling his mind, drowning out his thoughts. Stay with us, forever. The shadow's hand touched his chest, and a coldness unlike anything he'd ever felt seeped into him, a freezing darkness that drained the life from his bones. His vision blurred, the edges of the world fading to black, as the last thing he saw was the shadow pulling him into the tree, into the endless darkness of the whispering woods. The search teams found Jake's flashlight the next morning, lying in the clearing at the base of the massive tree, its beam still flickering, casting a faint light over the twisted roots. There was no sign of Jake. No tracks, no indication he'd ever been there at all. And now, on quiet nights, the townspeople say you can hear whispers in the woods, soft voices calling out, 
echoing through the trees. They say that if you listen closely, you might hear Jake among them, his voice blending with the others, forever lost, a prisoner of the whispering woods. No one goes near that clearing anymore. Not since the day they added Jake's name to the long, growing list of the lost. There was a case every cop in town called the Room at Riverview Hotel. It was the sort of legend that people whispered about after dark but never discussed in the light of day. The Riverview was an old, crumbling hotel that had been abandoned for decades, yet it held a terrifying reputation. Room 209, specifically, was the heart of the story. People said that anyone who went into that room alone would come out changed, if they came out at all. Late one night, Officer Ryan Grant got the call. Teenagers were trespassing in the Riverview, daring each other to spend the night in room 209. Ryan was a pragmatic man, always the first to shut down talk of the supernatural, but he'd heard his fair share of stories about that room. And when he arrived at the Riverview, standing alone under the pale glow of his flashlight, he felt a chill run down his spine. The front door creaked as he pushed it open, revealing a grand, decaying lobby, long abandoned to time. Dust hung thick in the air, swirling in his flashlight beam, and the silence was absolute. He made his way up the wide, creaking staircase, past faded wallpaper and peeling paint, to the second floor. Room 209 was at the end of a dark, narrow hallway. He noticed the air growing colder as he approached, his breath misting in the beam of his flashlight. The kids must have already scattered, he thought. The place was as quiet as a tomb. But then, from the room at the end of the hall, he heard a noise, soft like the faint rustling of fabric or perhaps someone moving in bed. His skin prickled. Slowly, he walked toward the door, raising his flashlight and calling out, Police! If anyone's here, make yourself known. Silence. The faint noise stopped. He took a deep breath and reached for the doorknob, finding it surprisingly cold under his hand. The door creaked open, revealing a room that looked surprisingly intact. There was a large bed in the center, an old armchair by the window, and a vanity with a cracked mirror. The air was freezing, and a damp, musty smell filled his lungs. Ryan swept his flashlight across the room and saw no sign of the kids. He stepped inside and was about to call for backup when the door swung shut behind him with a loud slam. Heart pounding, he spun around, grabbing the handle, but it wouldn't budge. His radio crackled, the static thick and loud, and then a voice broke through, soft, whispering, barely audible. Help me, he froze. The voice was faint, distorted, like it was coming from a long distance. He tried the door again, jiggling the handle, but it remained firmly locked. Help me, please, the voice whispered again, clearer now. It was a woman's voice, filled with desperation. He turned, shining his light across the empty room, his mind racing. Who's there, he called, trying to keep his voice steady. Where are you? Silence. Then, in the corner of his vision, he noticed something odd. The vanity mirror. It was cracked, but he could see a faint shape in its reflection. Slowly, he raised his flashlight, focusing on the mirror, and his blood went cold. In the reflection stood a woman, pale and ghostly, with sunken eyes and hollow cheeks, wearing an old-fashioned white dress. She was staring directly at him, her eyes dark and filled with terror. Her lips moved soundlessly, repeating her plea over and over again. Help me. Ryan stumbled back, his heart hammering. He turned to look at the room directly, but there was no one there. Only the empty bed, the cracked walls, the peeling paint. But when he looked back at the mirror, she was still there, her eyes fixed on him as if she could see him, as if she needed him. Who are you? He whispered, his voice barely audible. The woman's eyes widened and her lips trembled as she whispered back. They trapped me. Please, don't leave. He felt a tug at the edge of his mind, an overwhelming urge to stay, to reach out and touch the mirror. His fingers inched forward, drawn by a force he couldn't explain. Her expression shifted, a hint of hope flickering in her dark, hollow eyes. And then, in a movement so fast it was almost a blur, she reached through the mirror, her cold hand seizing his wrist. The shock hit him like ice water, freezing and sharp, as if her touch drained the warmth from his body. Her grip was strong, impossibly strong, and he could feel her pulling him closer, dragging him toward the glass. Panic flooded him as he struggled to pull free, but her eyes bore into him, pleading and desperate. They won't let me go. I'm trapped, she whispered, her voice echoing through his mind. 
He fought, his muscles straining, and finally wrenched himself free, stumbling back and gasping for air. The woman's face twisted in anguish as she reached for him, her fingers pressing against the inside of the glass, leaving foggy prints as if she were trapped on the other side. Please, help me. The light in the room flickered, and the temperature seemed to drop even further, his breath coming out in thick, visible clouds. He backed up, keeping his flashlight trained on the mirror, half expecting her to break through. Then he noticed something in the corner of the room, a small, old-fashioned door, almost hidden in the shadows. It was ajar, and from within he could hear faint whispers, almost like chanting, rhythmic and low. He felt a powerful compulsion to open it, to see what was behind. Heart pounding, he approached the door, pushing it open to reveal a narrow, dark stairway leading down into what seemed like an impossible depth, He could feel cold air seeping up from below, carrying a rotten smell as though something had been decaying there for years. He took a step down and the whispers grew louder, filling his ears with a strange hypnotic rhythm. But as he descended, he felt something in his mind shift, a sense of wrongness, as though the stairs were taking him somewhere far from the world he knew. Just then, he heard her voice again, echoing up from the darkness, but it was louder, clearer, filled with a bone-chilling urgency. Turn back! They're waiting. Don't let them trap you, too. A surge of adrenaline snapped him out of the trance. He stumbled back up the stairs, his heart racing as he dashed back into room 209, slamming the small door behind him. The mirror's reflection flickered, and he saw her again, but now she was screaming. Her hands pressed against the glass, her mouth open in a silent wail of terror. Behind her, he could see faint shapes, dark, twisted figures, shadows stretching and writhing, reaching out for her. Run, she mouthed, her eyes wide with fear. Without a second thought, Ryan lunged for the door, yanking on the handle. This time, it gave way, swinging open with a loud creak. He didn't look back as he sprinted down the hall, his footsteps echoing through the empty hotel as he fled down the stairs and burst out into the night. Only when he was outside did he stop, gasping for breath, the cold night air filling his lungs. He turned to look back at the river view, and there, in the second-story window of room 209, he saw her, a pale figure standing in the darkness, watching him with sad, hollow eyes. She raised her hand, pressing it against the glass one last time, and then she was gone. Ryan never went back to the Riverview Hotel. To this day, he can't explain what happened in that room or who the woman was, but he'll never forget her face or the terror in her eyes. And he'll always wonder who or what was waiting in the darkness below that little door, and what would have happened if he'd kept going down those stairs. The river view was torn down a few years later, and a strip mall took its place. But even now, people say that on cold nights, if you walk by and listen closely, you can still hear faint whispers echoing through the empty air. And some swear they see a pale woman in the glass windows, her hand pressed against the glass, still waiting for someone to set her free.